Okay, we're back. We're live. It's 4 p.m. on a given Wednesday, and you know what that means here on ThinkTech. It means Hawaii, the state of clean energy, uh, where Mitch Ewan and I delve into what is really going on out there and try to understand the sector and, and uh, what is happening to it and how, and how well we're doing in reaching our goals, which are coming closer every day. And to help us understand today, we have Megan Fernandez. Uh, she is with uh, Pacific Business News. She's a star reporter in energy, and we always like to have reporters on the show. May I also say um, that, you know, the reporters have a certain mystique. Uh, they, know more, they know more than the average person. They carry around with them the power of the pen, and that's why it's always great to have reporters on the show. Hi, welcome to the show, Megan. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, uh, Mitch, uh, you know, why don't you frame up the issues for a minute and sort of give us some direction on where we want to go today? Thanks, Jay. I love that opportunity. So what we want to talk about is energy and the energy system here in Hawaii. And one of the big uh, issues that's coming up or uh, great ideas that are coming up is how can we mobilize the energy system to uh, restart the economy and get us moving get jobs going, and what are the uh, opportunities, and then what are the barriers, or not even barriers, but maybe just speed bumps that uh, we're inflicting upon ourselves that kind of stops that process from going. So you've delved into it recently. You've, you've uh, attended this meeting with all the great minds in Hawaii that were talking about energy and the energy system. Well, certainly yesterday, <laughs> Megan went to a, uh, like actually it was a virtual attendance. She went to this uh, meeting uh, set up and I guess uh, Brian K. Aloha was uh, chairing the meeting on Zoom and um, a, a lot of heavyweights there. And she wrote a piece that appeared in this morning's PBN about it, uh, which we've looked at. And I think that's a great place to start, Mitch. Right. So Megan, tell us what happened at the meeting. Uh, you know, um, tell us what, what your story included. Yeah, so it was about um, the Hawaii Chamber of Commerce having, um, inviting a lot of local politicians and just local um, industry experts and just talking about, okay, we, we know we have the state mandates coming up, um, you know, but what about, what can we do now in order to kind of help the state recover? How can we use energy as a way to kind of diversify Hawaii's economy. Um, and there really is no straight answer to that um, from really any of the panelists, because it's not a simple thing. You know, um, one thing that, you know, the, the new chief energy officer, Scott Glenn, was kind of speaking on is uh, right now they're looking at it in kind of three buckets, the short term, the intermediate term, and the long term. And we're kind of right now looking at that short term of what can be done in the next months, few months to a year in order to try to have energy essentially be kind of a, a player in the economy. Um, and then, like I said, that's no small feat um, because especially with nowadays um, with COVID and everything, people are kind of a little bit more reduced on spending. So how do we get folks to try to keep the industry going with solar installations or you know utility scale solar projects um, while still kind of keeping in mind that consumer um, is kind of a little bit hesitant right now to try to go towards some of that stuff. Yeah, that's true. I, you know, I, I walk the neighborhood here in my, in my neighborhood and uh, I see people I know and they go to the other side of the street. It's not because I didn't take a shower. They, they are afraid to be near anyone else. You yeah. know? And I think that that kind of fear pervades our community I, and it's rational. It's okay. I understand. But uh, if we have a conversation, it's like a 30 paces. Um, nobody I'm is inviting that, you. Yeah. I'm hearing that from a lot of the solar installers too, of um, some projects are being delayed because people don't want them in or near their homes right now, or they don't want to interact. Um, so it's really just a tough time for the industry altogether right now. Well, you know what it sounds like, Megan? It sounds like this, you know, if you answer the first question, that is the short term period, and um, you ask what can, you know, it's like John Kennedy question. What can we do for, what, what, what can we do to get the solar industry or rather the energy industry to help reopen the economy? What can we do? I don't, I don't think it's too profound because what, you know, all we really can do really is get it to do what we had hoped it was gonna be doing before. We, we were hoping the solar guys would go install. Uh, we're hoping these the 16 projects would be built um that's about it right and we're not there 
we, we lost the momentum on that. So what can we expect? I don't know if this was discussed at the meeting, but really what I would like to, what I expect, you know, the answer is, is uh, just do what you were supposed to be doing. See if you can get back on the train. Uh, it's nothing remarkable, nothing profound, just do what you were doing. <laughs> I don't know if anything else came up in that context, but uh, to me, as you say, it's not so easy. Mm -hmm. People are afraid. Yeah. What do you think, well, Mitch? Another question is like, can you get the materials? Like, it's great to have these multi megawatt uh, arrays that we want to install, but do we have a warehouse full of uh, PV panels here in Hawaii? Maybe not, you know, and then, you know, the, it's, a pan, it's a worldwide pandemic. Our suppliers may be coming from China. You know, we don't have that many high um, uh, solar panel manufacturers in the U.S. anymore. Most of that went offshore. So what's, you know, what's the lag time from the time you say pull the whistle and, uh, and say go? So one of, one of the points that uh, Scott Glenn uh, brought out was, you know, looking at workforce development. I mean, that's something that we have control over in that we can get people trained up on some of these new technologies. For example, I'm having interactions with the Hawaii Community College on the Big Island, and we're looking at workforce development for uh, people that will be operating various electric transportation, not just hydrogen, although I'd like it just to be hydrogen, <laughs> but also uh, ordinary electric vehicles. Um, there's a lot of technology there. If an electric vehicle gets hit and rolls over, you know, they're all electric. They all have these big power cables. You don't want the first responders electrocuting themselves. And you certainly don't want to pull a guy out of a car if he's you know, still alive and then electrocute him trying to get him out. So here's an opportunity where we can mobilize a lot of people to go and take these classes and get trained up on the technology in, in anticipation of the rollout coming forward. And you know, from the community college's point of view, they have to develop the courseware mm -hmm. and we have to leverage resources and, and get them rolling on that. So I'll stop talking and let you guys- No, but, no, but I think that's, that's really a very good point anytime. I mean, if, if you know, sure we should do that, but we could do that and we should do it all the time. We should have the most you know, well-trained, sophisticated uh, you know, workers in, a, in an energy task force in the world. We can do that. And but, so, it, it, you know, sometimes um, necessity is the mother of invention. And if they can do that now, that's all the better. But we should be doing it anyway. So the question is, okay, let's take that one and work backward. The workforce. Was there any discussion or did you have any thoughts, Megan, about how? Who does that? Go to the community colleges? Was there somebody going to push a button on the community college? Was somebody going to fund a program, start a program? Uh, or was that just um, aspirational? Uh, from what Glenn was saying, it really needs to be on, um, it needs to be everyone's responsibility. It needs to be, you know, discussions between the state energy office and the um, universities, as well as the chamber of commerce and trade organizations. And everyone really has to play a part in kind of building this pipeline. So even though the industry may be struggling now, um, it can kind of be a pathway in order to when those jobs are available and when people do become more comfortable and um, things open back up, then we have those positions of, you know, uh, they're able to be filled by people who are trained and qualified and ready to just hit the ground running. So I think it's, it's really not necessarily one person's responsibility. I think everyone kind of plays a part in this. But so I, hope, I, least, so I hope at least a few people step and, and do it. Um, you know, I remember a few years ago, Hawaii Energy Policy Forum under the tutelage of Sharon Moriwaki organized it, uh, a full day tour uh, going from Union Hall to Union Hall around Honolulu and, um, and checking them out on their training programs because they wanted to train solar installers. And it was impressive. They offered, uh, they had great equipment there. They had great teachers there. Um, and they had careers. I mean, you know, the union was offering careers in this area. I don't know if that still exists, but it seems to me that any conversation around this building task force should include the unions um, because they, you know, they're motivated to build members as well as a task force. Um, anyway, the other, uh, did, I, did I cut somebody off? Mitch, did you want to say something? No, I was just going to say that, um, make the comment that somebody in government has got to be have a, the button on his forehead and say, I'm the guy that's going to get this going. And it, was that in the lay, Department of Labor or whoever, but somebody needs to step up the plate and take the leadership role and pull all these 
you know, herd all these cats together, get them in the room and say, okay, what, what's the plan? What's the first thing we're gonna do? And then initiate it. One of the big things I had, uh, I wrote the hydrogen plan for the state of Hawaii, a 10 year plan. And then I had a chapter on how, how are you gonna implement this? And I said, establish a Hawaii implement, implementation authority. And so that you get all, and there's all sorts of competition going on. You get them all in the same room, like I just said, you hear all the pros and cons and then one guy with the authority says, okay, this is how we're gonna do it. And, and then he has the authority to implement it and get it going and stopping all the departments from arguing with each other and turf battles and all this stuff and get going guys. And I think that's probably what we need here is a, a new mentality of a little bit of authority, whether it comes from the government or from the governor's office like that's what they have in California. They have a they have a guy who's in the government governor's office who implements their hydrogen thing for the for the uh, the state. And so if some guy acts up, they can phone the governor's office and get some kind of a referee to blow the whistle and make the determination. That's what we need here. <laughs> we need people to step up the plate, take ownership, and ram it through, push yeah. it. One of the pieces in your story that was uh, very interesting it was the thing about uh, Senator Wakai, uh, who complained that there was no plan. Um, and yet, you know, he's a very serious, uh, rather senior and serious senator. Um, he could certainly shepherd a plan through or, or cause the leadership, uh, Kochi and the, and the like, to, uh, um, you know, create a task force, uh, designate a committee to handle it, whatever, maybe the energy committee in the Senate and, uh, and make a plan. Um, and and I, I really found it interesting and, and I'm sure you did too, uh, that uh, this is a Senator who was in a position to do something about it, claiming there was no plan. But the, the oblique reference of course, was that the governor had not made a plan. Can you, mm -hmm. can you tell us the discussion around that that took place? Um, yeah, so there was a question posed to him of just um, kind of about what his thoughts were and um, that kind of discussion from him centered around, uh, I think, just some of the confusion and, you know, some of the, in some cases, lack of direct plans or leadership that have happened during COVID of the navigator, the, the miscommunications of different proclamations and how are we you know, the question hasn't been answered yet. How are we going to eventually get tourism from the mainland and, um, you know, other countries back here? And so, um, you know, as far as energy's role in that, you know, he, he did say, you know, that he, he does want to try to, to help. But right now, I think that, um, you know, from what he was saying, um, right now, it's just there's not enough of a, a government coherence um, working together on that right now. Mm, yeah. um, like he was saying, just what's next? You know, how do we move forward from here? You know, yeah. and like I said, that's not an easy question for anybody to answer really right now until we have more guidelines of uh, and, and timelines of what we want to do and where we want to go, where we want to be. Yeah, we don't even know what the timeline is. We don't know when we're ready to go back. You know, if you posit going back on the basis of public confidence, you know, where I feel more comfortable talking to my neighbor and, and having installers come in my house and the like, and, you know, proceeding with the economy. I don't know when, if you say, well, you know, we're supposed to be in a reopening. I say, you, you know, that's fine, but I'm talking about me and I'm not taking any chances. <laughs> this, is, this is too dangerous to take chances. It, it struck me funny. It can make declare a reopening, but we really don't have control of the disease yet. Uh, so when you, when you finish controlling disease, give me a call, uh, then, I'll, then I'm happy to participate. I think a lot of people are in the same boat. And that goes to allowing the installer in your house and making a, you know, a deal to have some, some solar put on. It, allow, it goes to the question of a, you know, a contractor who wants to come and do one of those 16 projects or an investor, an entrepreneur, and it, the, the labor guys who have to go out in the field and go shoulder to shoulder with other labor guys uh, wearing a mask or not. Um, and, the, you know, they're at a certain risk to do that. And I think you're going to find some reluctance. And the balance, of course, is how much do you need the paycheck and how much risk are you willing to undertake? Uh, at the end of the day, though, I think you're both right. At the end of the day, it's about leadership. Um, it's about somebody stepping up and saying, okay, this is what we do. We're going to go here now. And, and I think, um, you know, what we have, and it's both federal and state and city, 
is a situation where in the, in the, dire, con the dire straits of the pandemic, um, you find who you really have. You find your, the systems you really have, the leadership, um, what do we call it, culture that you really have. And I think Hawaii has been bogged down with this consensus model for a long time. Uh, Hawaii, um, you know, to go, go along, don't make it, don't make a, um, and you know, the problem with that is that when, uh, when you're in a, in a pandemic and having a crisis in, a, in an economic sense, um, we got to look and see who's leading here. And so far, don't you agree, Mitch? So far, we haven't found out yet. We haven't, you know, it hasn't gotten to the point where somebody has stood up and said, follow me, boys, I'll show you the way. Um, and maybe, maybe a conference like this, Megan, is a, is a step in that direction. Um, yeah. Definitely. I always think that getting everyone in the room, even if it's a virtual room, um, it, that creates a lot of really conducive dialogue. And yeah. kind of conducive dialogue is really kind of, that can be the spark and that just kind of sets the fire um, and gets us going to where we need to be, for sure. Well, you know, this, this has to be taken uh, in, uh, in juxtaposition to the fact that the Maui Energy Conference, which was set for July, is going to be by Zoom only, and it's going to be a. Um, we had a show about this just a week ago. Yeah, right. it's going to be a reduced version uh, with a reduced number of speakers and uh, very efficient. So much so that it's free. Yeah. <laughs> In the past, it was very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and people can, you know, they can watch on Zoom. Um, but oh, I am sad you... I won't be able to come out to Maui to see it. <laughs> to <laughs> Me too. Meet all you guys. And... <laughs> story so the you know the question is uh you know given the, the, this uh, you know program you had yesterday at the chamber of commerce and and the maui thing being skinny down um do we have the momentum uh, to actually see this through do we have the momentum to achieve um you know some kind of significant participation in redeveloping the economy uh in, in you know in 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 a coordinated fashion with the um, with the end of the crisis, you know, I mean, it's great to to do it after. It's it's dangerous to do it before. How do you time yourself? But do we have the momentum? Um, did you see that? Did you feel? I know it's a very subjective thing, Megan. But what did you feel about the, you know, the interest, the vitality of the speakers and and other people who were there? Uh, everyone that that spoke, and there was quite a few uh, folks there representing each of the counties and. Um, stuff like that. You, you could tell everyone was concerned. Everyone has a passion and they, they want to see things get better. Um, the, the, the trouble is it's just how do we pivot? You know, um, COVID has brought in a lot of that question in every industry. Um, and energy is no different. You know, how do we pivot from the door-to-door -door sales or the, the types of marketing they used to do for solar into a suddenly entirely digital? How do you, how do you move anything, you know, and just move forward in a way that you can stay in business, keep your people employed, and yet still kind of think about the future. Um, and so I think that not only the conducive dialogue, but uh, discussion around how that pivot, what and what that look, pivot looks like um, is really kind of the next steps. And that's kind of what I got from that um, dialogue as well. But I want to tell you about one little theory I've been working on. As a matter of fact, I, I wrote a little commentary on it recently. It's that um, we live in an altered state now. I'm we sorry, live in an altered state. state. An altered state. Oh, altered state. Okay. And more specifically, we live in an altered state of time. Time does not have the same meaning to us. Uh, you know, it's out of Fiddler on the Roof, sunrise, uh, sunset, and it's just a sort of, it's a, it's a blend of night and day where we don't have the sense. I mean, it's bad enough we don't have seasons here, but um, it's just a blend from day. night and day. I, you know, the, the weeks go by, the weekends blend into the weekdays. It's an altered sense of time. And my, I come out of it, and I'm, I think there's probably something here. I come out of it feeling that the, the COVID, the whole experience, not only for me, but the people I normally engage with, is costing me time. It's, it's taking time away because I can't do the things I would normally do. I enjoy my, my life at home, it's very nice, but I'm not able to do things that I would do. So the forward motion for my time is slowed down. 
And I feel that, you know, in, in my remaining years, there's a hole here. There's a hole in the boat. And my time is draining out the bottom. They can say, oh, that's very personal, Fidel. But in fact, I think that exists, whether you like it or not, for business also. Because business initiatives have a hole in the boat too. It's not just that you can't do anything, but the time is going by. And it's enveloping you. And it's stopping you. And it's got to have a, not only a psychological effect, but a sort of a business a business social effect on people involved. What do you think about my crazy theory, eh? Well, I think you should get busy on the internet and do more research, Jay, and not waste your time just lounging around every morning. I, I want to make a comment about the energy side, though. Like, so, you know, I've been locked up here for a long time in County Way Bay, but, you know, HECO was still out reinstalling telephone poles and new wires and, and, and building up the resilience because one of the advantages is there's not a lot of people on the road right now. So they can lay out telephone poles on the roads, you can fix the roads, you can do some of this infrastructure improvement without having to stop every five minutes. So you might be able to get the job done in one day where if you're like business as normal, maybe it would take a week because you know every time a car comes by, they got to stop work, move the poles, move the trucks, let this one car go by. And that's all you know, a waste of time. So there's, you got to look at the situation and say, well, what can I do now? I think, I think uh, the city and the county and the state, the uh, Department of Transportation, they're looking at that. They're going around making major uh, repairs to roads and parking lots and all this kind of stuff. So that's things we can be doing and keeps people employed and also keeps the, the wheels moving here. So, you know, the bus drivers are still out there driving the buses and and, uh, you know, uh, the, the repairmen are still out there doing their thing. I mean, we still have construction guys coming here where I live right now and to getting, getting on with things. And I find actually like having an, an hour and a half extra time not sitting on the road commuting is a really good thing. Definitely so, a benefit, yeah. Your industry, Megan, how, yeah. how, do you, how are you finding it getting out? I mean, you must spend a lot of time in front of your computer anyway. And, you can do interviews by Zoom or whatever to get that little bit more personal touch. How are you finding it? It's, it's been a challenge. Um, while I also enjoy my commute time to my couch, um, you know, it, it's, been, it's been difficult some days, you know, because I'm very much uh, the type of reporter that enjoys going out, meeting people face to face, talking story over coffee and stuff like that. And we can't do that anymore. Um, you know, our, our face to face interviews and stuff have been very limited. Um, so a lot of it is doing just this right now. It's talking over Zoom or it's phone calls. And, um, you know, so I do miss that that kind of human touch to it of uh, being able to meet in person. But, um, I, you know, and also our, our print days are now all virtual, whereas we used to, you know, print out the copy of the newspaper and, you know, make hard marks on it. Uh, we can't do that. <laughs> you know, we're all separated. So it's, it's been a little bit of a learning curve, but I, I think that could be said for all industries, you know, um, just in, I, I cover many beats, energy is just one of them, but I kind of hear that all around is, um, you know, everything essentially business as usual has paused since mid-March and we're, we're still in that pause, even though retail and malls and restaurants are, are still, they're open, not to the same capacity, but um, I do agree with you, things do feel kind of still paused until we, we do get back to that uh, or whatever the new normal is, as people say, but um, it's presented its challenges. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, reports of, um, you know, economic activity are anecdotal. Um, you know, the only thing that really counts is the state product and all that. And let's see how many people are working. Let's see how much money is being made and generated. And I suppose you could ask how many... Uh, how many tourists are coming, going, being being asked to leave, <laughs> as yeah, the case may be. <laughs> in the slammer for you know, X days until- Whatever you like. But you know, one of the, you know, the thing about it is that we're all involved in discovering new techniques. And, and Megan yeah. talks about being a reporter. And I, and I wanna ask one question about that. You know, so life is different. And you know, it's different for think tech, I can tell you. And we're, we're kissing cousins in, you know, in terms of media. Um, so when you, when you do it differently, when you spend your time you know, on Zoom and on the phone and email instead of in person where you, know, you don't, you don't uh, what is it, uh, see the sweat of their brow and, and you know, all that and you know, 
sort of get a credibility read by being close to them when they talk to you. Um, so you have other systems, you're developing other systems. And it seems to me that some of these systems are more efficient, they have to be, than what was going on before. So the job of being a reporter, especially in a business, you know, a business area, um, is, is not only different, but it's a discovery and it's promising. And then if I ask you at the end of this crisis, uh, who knows when that will be, you want to go back to the way it was way back when, or you want to continue to do some of these things now, I suspect yeah. you're going to tell me, no, no, I, I learned how to do it. I want to keep on doing it this way. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, there have been some things where, it, uh, like I said, it's challenges, but also it's it's nice uh, kind of pros as well, you know, um, with people working remotely and um, stuff like that. A lot of people have more time to talk, um, so they rather have a quick phone call or Zoom meeting rather than, you know, uh, scheduling the time for us to meet somewhere or for, you know, me to drive out to them and stuff like that. So it's a time saver in that aspect of I don't have a commute and I don't have to commute out to interviews. Um, but I, I think it's, it is interesting how um, I think it's, it's opened more doors in the sense of people are able to make more time because they have more time in their day too, you know. Um, and I've heard that even from some of the, um, you know, local accelerators too, who bring in experts um, kind of like this over Zoom to uh, mentor is you see people um, are a lot more able to kind of carve out that time nowadays. You know, this reminds me of a show we did yesterday with Howard Wig. You guys know Howard Wig, right? Yeah. Dbed, uh, the, the code green guy who deals with the building codes and, mm -hmm. and he's devoted to energy. And uh, so he he's organized a, a webinar from a guy in New York City uh, who is into ultraviolet light um, and um, you know, as, as a way to uh, deal with the virus, to kill the virus, you know. And uh, he, he, he put the word out and a lot of people are coming to this particular webinar, it's lo really local, except that yeah. the, the guest, uh, who is probably getting an honorarium, an honorarium, you know, in, in, in the process, doesn't have to come here. And, right. and you know, that's sort of like proof of concept. I mean, when, for example, they want to do a Maui energy conference or any energy conference involving an expert in New York City, then he had to come here. And maybe he doesn't want to come here and you pay him for honorarium because he's a big name, but then you have him on a show just like this. So my question to you, Megan is, you know, do you see that the energy sector going through the same process that you've been going through where they learn about efficiencies um, in, you know, in conducting business in doing energy, doing the technology of energy. And when we come out the other end of this pipeline, we're actually in, in better shape because we have new systems on how to conduct ourselves and do business. I think so. Um, you know, in, through my reporting, I've noticed a lot of different pivots, um, both in energy and tech, because a lot of times they're kind of uh, correlated. And, you know, you see tech companies that may dabble in energy and tech, now moving towards helping COVID testing, um, helping make ventilators. So they've, they've pivoted kind of now in the moment to help out and to step up. Um, but I, I think really, like I mentioned earlier, um, solar companies are having to change how they market, um, the avail availability to how they install, maybe they wear more, you know, PPE and, um, you know, stuff like that. So I think there, there is a pivot, there's a shift. Um, and you know, each company is going to decide how they do that themselves, but I feel it kind of industry wide right now. Um, everyone's kind of figuring out their niche and how they can shift in that niche to be successful. Um, and I know the uh, PPP loans, a lot of solar companies did apply for those and some did get it. Um, so, you know, there's, there's definitely been, um, you know, how do we get the funding? How do we keep our people employed? And how do we try to promote that solar is important right now, that solar has a role? Um, yeah. So I really kind of feel that all around. Yeah, well, going forward, uh, who knows where we're going to be? Um, yeah. You know, the other thing that's uh, changing is, is journalism itself. And I say this, it's not just COVID, it's the last couple, three years, you know, um, where before, and I read the New York Times as much as I can and the Washington Post, where before they would, you know, report the news um, and it would be very matter of fact and their opinions were limited. Uh, now there's just as much opinion as there is news. Uh, and I guess they feel that these are the times that where people want that 
and that and that journalism requires it because uh, because um, you know they have the credibility and people want to know what they what they think about these things. So, for example, um, we're talking today about uh, the need for a state plan. We're talking today about the um, you know the reluctance of the public to engage in solar projects and other projects, community solar, whatever it might be. Um, and, and that's the fact, and that's what went on, went on at this conference yesterday. Um, but you know, what about uh, opinions? Uh, I mean, have you thought about this? Have you done this? What about opinions about, hey, where is the state plan? Or Mitch's question, you know, who puts, who, who puts it out? What, who steps forward on this? Who becomes a leader? We're waiting. Um, you know, this kind of, it's not really fact, it's opinion. It's even trying to nudge people, nudge them ahead, you know, and when, when it's obvious that they're not, not moving ahead. What about that in, in Hawaii, in, you know, your beat, um, in the, no, the dichotomy between fact reporting, which is always useful, and opinion reporting, which seems to be more useful now somehow, don't you think? Um, yeah, so I only strictly do fact reporting. Um... My editor, Cam, he does have a weekly column, the Poo Poo Platter, um, where he's able to kind of let his thoughts and opinions out. Um, but for my purposes as a reporter, um, I just stick to the facts because that's that's all I care about at the end of the day is what are the hard facts? Um, because, you know, you mentioned opinion pieces can sometimes push folks or, you know, push folks to um, get something done. Uh, fact pieces can do that just as well, too. You know, you <laughs> touche, <a> nice, touche. <laughs> you know, you, you put out a, a nice hard written research article that tells it like it is, tells the facts, tells both sides that could get just as much attention as opinion, you know? Um, so mm -hmm. that's kind of more what uh, I believe in or my niche, so to say, um, it's just really getting those facts and numbers out there because that's also what people want to know at the end of the day too is, all right, well, someone's in trouble, but what are the numbers? What's the proof? You know, because you say something just because I say it as an opinion doesn't mean it's true or doesn't mean I have something to back it up. So, <laughs> thank you for that. That's that's, that's really <laughs> great. I'm I'm so glad we had this conversation. So, Mitch, you're smiling. Do you realize that it's it's about time to summarize where we are and and where we've <laughs> gone and where we might go in the future? Uh, Mitch is very good at this. You'll see. You're oh, you're muted, Mitch. Muted, yeah, yeah. I have people talking. I have my my uh, smoke alarm's been going off all afternoon, so you know, it's like it's been a three ring circus here. But anyway, to to sum up, we, we started off talking about the energy system and uh, what we could be doing to uh, to to uh, get it going again, and, and also be a little bit innovative. And uh, from that, we uh, branched off into basically how how business is actually operating, and we talked about how reporters, you know, how their life has changed and how, how they, uh, you know, uh, are, are challenged or, or have different challenges now to, to get the facts and get out there and, and get the story. And so uh, that was a very interesting conversation. And uh, thank you very much, Megan, for coming on and illuminating us on these things. And I hope you got some facts out of this, although it was all opinion, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I'm going to carry on with Jay's uh, advice to me is to make the closing fast. Okay. So thank you very much, Megan. It was great. Thank you, talking. Megan. Megan Fernandez, uh, PBN. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Aloha. Until next time.